All right. Last time we started with some of the primitive orders, looking at some of the uh, least advanced, shall we say, of these uh, insect orders. Now we're going to look at some of the uh, other primitive orders and then move on to some that are a little more quote unquote evolved. All right, the Protura. So this third primitive order are known as the Protura. Now remember back to the Plurins, there was no real primitive name. The same thing happens with this group. Um, we tend to just call them Proturans, although I have heard them called Coneheads, I guess, but this isn't really common. So, like the Diplurans, uh, these insects are very, very tiny, usually less than two millimeters long on average. Uh, and this is a really primitive group. Uh, they have a head, uh, they have a thorax, and an abdomen, but they lack many of the other features that we recognize as important to insects. In fact, their scientific name means first and tail. So you can break up these scientific names, and I'll mention this a little later, into a, a root word and usually a suffix. So when you see pro as the root word, that means first or foremost, and ura means tail. Now, these insects are so primitive that they completely lack things like eyes and wings and antennae. Now, remember, we stated that all insects have a single pair of antennae. Well, this is one of those times when an organism has decided not to fit into that nice discrete box that we made for it. This is an issue. So, proturans actually go back and forth. People will decide to put them in insecta, not put them in insecta, put them back in insecta, not. And it just goes back and forth like that because of that lack of antennae. We have them, though, in insecta because um, these insects actually have some organs that function as antennae, although they're not true antennae. It's actually their first pair of legs. Their legs are enlarged. Uh, they have these really huge forelegs, and they actually fulfill that function of the antennae. So you can see here, see these really large forelegs, and you can see this video there these things are moving so they hold them out sort of in front of them and kind of up and they act just like antennae so at the moment we are putting Pratur into the insecta however it may go back and forth as people decide to start looking at this again now the nymphs and the adults of the uh, Protura live in soil and they live in leaf litter they tend to feed on decomposing matter and on fluids they always need to be in a really moist environment. This is because they are so incredibly, incredibly small. So they're very, very permeable when it comes to their cuticle or to their exoskeleton. So they can lose water really quickly. And if they ever wander into a very arid environment, they're just gonna dry out and die. Now, there are only three families of uh, Protura found in North America. Two of these families don't have even a tracheal system. Their method of gas exchange is so primitive that they simply get oxygen by diffusing it directly through their integument. So these things are insanely primitive, but you can find them outside in moist environments. Okay, so that was it for like those first three major primitive orders. Now, we're going to be looking at some slightly more evolved insects. This this next order is still considered primitive, but it's a, a little more oh, evolved. It has a little bit more um, interesting adaptations than these first uh, three that we looked at over the past two lectures. So this next order is the Thysanura, commonly known as the silverfish and the fire brats. So I mentioned this just uh, just a second ago, but as we go through order names, you're going to start to notice a pattern. Most of the orders are named using Latin and Greek words, and this is usually based on physical characteristics of the insects within that order. If you know the root words and what the suffixes mean, then you can kind of get an idea as to what the insects are going to look like or act like in that particular group. This is why a lot of scientists take things like Latin and Greek in college. It's easier to understand what a scientific name means if you have an understanding of the language. 
Anyhow, you can take scientific names apart. They usually have a root. In this case, the root word is thysin. Okay? And then they have a prefix or a suffix. In this case, the suffix is ura or ura. So in, in uh, Greek and Latin, thysin means fringed, while ura means tail. So in the case of Thysinura, the name is describing the three caudal appendages present on the insect. So these three tail-like things hanging off that last abdominal segment. <clears throat> so the fact that they have fringe hanging off of these three um, caudal appendages gives it this name of literally fringe-tailed. So they literally mean fringe-tailed Thysinura. Neat. Now, the overall body form of this group is relatively flat. They live under things for the most part, so they have to be able to get under stuff to feed. In general, the silverfish are much flatter than the general group of fire brats. Most are often covered with silver or gray scales, and if you touch one of these insects, you're going to come away with what looks like dust on your finger. That's the scales coming off. They have compound eyes, but these are relatively small in most of the species. There are a few species that they're completely absent. Um, this should tell you a little bit about their feeding practices, right? Uh, they have these mandibulate mouth parts. They have almost no uh, eyes. They don't need a lot of eyes. So it's obvious that they are not predators. They have long thread-like or filiform antennae, which they can use to read, quote unquote, the world around them. So, <clears throat> the insects are considered pests when they invade homes. Uh, the silverfish can cause extensive damage to household goods. They've been known to feed on wallpaper paste, on book bindings, on the starch of some textiles, uh, on cardboard, and on paper products. This is why when you store boxes of books or old school papers or that sort of thing in your garage or in your attic, you're going to find silverfish in those boxes after a time. They're actually feeding on the cellulose of that paper. So this is an example down here of the type of damage that silverfish can do. They can just feed their way through all this paper, causing a complete ruination of books that are in storage for a long time. They're not dangerous, though. Uh, those mandibulate mouth parts are used for chewing up paper and for textiles. They do not bite humans. The fire brats, on the other hand, this is what a fire brat looks like. So here's a fire brat up here. This is the silverfish here. The fire brats are found uh, outdoors, so they're mostly outdoor species. They're found primarily in forests, under barks of, bark of trees, under fallen logs, that sort of thing, and they have a much rounder appearance than the silverfish. And they really don't interact with humans at all. So these don't come inside and feed on your stuff, they just stay outdoors. Now the fire brats can be really long-lived. There are some species that can live more than six years, which is just ridiculous for an insect in the wild. Now, the Thysinura in general, just as an order, have been known to practice mimicry. So they can mimic other insects in the wild. There are some species that will actually mimic ants. They'll use this mimicry to sneak into ant hives to steal the ant collected food. All right. So that's it for these two orders. Uh, up next, we're going to be moving on to some even more interesting orders. Let me know if you have any questions.